I have a lot of freedom in knowing that current Benjamin Hardy is nowhere near finished. And it doesn't matter if I'm unpolished right now, if I don't have everything figured out. It doesn't matter if my bank account's not what I want to be. But that's the essence of a growth mindset actually is, is to not attach to your current self, but to be more interested in your future self. You have a PhD in organizational psychology. So I get why as like, you know, a trained psychologist, you would write about that kind of stuff. But you were like the number one writer on Medium for years back to back. You've authored four books, two of them I have here. I mean, this one, amazing. Not, not anything against, you know, who, not how. And you have an upcoming book that I am loving, The Gap in the Gain, it comes out in October. But, but here's a question I have for you. Like in your writing, as a writer, you're so transparent, but then you bring together these stories and these references to studies and all, you do it so effortlessly. How do you do that? Probably uh, a series of things. You know, I grew up in a traumatic environment, which I write about pretty openly in my books. My father was a drug addict after my parents got divorced. And that was just a, a dark period of my life. I'm very positive about it now. I mean, it was all gains from, you know, gap in the gain perspective. I'm very grateful for those experiences totally, totally have utilized those experiences to improve my life. But I, I then went on a church mission. And I think what, what happened on that experience was just watching myself transform. I, I just watched myself grow in ways that I actually did not expect. Uh, and at heights that I did not but, but expect. You, but you noticed the growth. Oh, I felt like it in the real whole way time. through. <clears throat> totally. Yeah. And um, I mean, I, I felt like I was like vaulting up, up buildings um, because I was pretty low on the ground. You know, I barely graduated high school. I had zero self-esteem. And so, you know, starting to like learn uh, about, a, you know, having a positive identity, uh, starting to watch myself succeed, starting to actually have meaningful experiences, even hard experiences where I'm out in like rough, pl rough places and, you know, in dirty homes and, you know, doing community service and just reading great books. And then I'll, I'll also, um, journaling very deeply about my own experiences and journaling about my past and, and feeling the weight of my own pain kind of disappear and watching myself learn, grow, and then ultimately develop confidence and capability. Uh, those things just were so exciting to me that that's what led me to ultimately wanting to become a psychologist. That's what ultimately led me to wanting to write the types of books I had was just the thrill and the feeling of of growth and of, of healing, honestly. So yeah, that's, I do. I write these books, honestly, for myself. I'm, 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 I'm still just learning all this stuff and it, it's a lot of enjoyment to just go ahead and share it with as many people as possible. Yeah. So what's interesting to me about your writing style is, um, so you are very vulnerable in your writing. You are open, you share, you reference a lot of other stories and other things. And I've read other books in this vein or of this type where, you know, they'll say like, you need to set up your tasks. So like when I was writing this book, I had to set up these tasks and I did. And, but the way you do it, like the way they do it makes it seem lazy. Like, why are you referencing the writing process in a book trying to like, but, but the way you do it, it's just so vulnerable and true, you know, in who, not how, uh, you with Dan Sullivan, you specifically kind of break down a lot about even the process of publishing and even, you know, your connection to Tucker Max and like you reference so many other people in your writing, you, you reference what you're working through yourself. Um, I love that about your writing style, but, but if I were to approach it that way, I would feel lazy. I would feel mm. like I would, it, it would make me feel like I'm not writing the right way. Is yeah. that something that you ever bump up against? Cause you do it so well. Oh, she's <laughs> very generous. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I don't really. So like I, I, I grew up as a, like in my own writing, I, I started by just journaling. I was a pure journal writer. Uh, I did get academic training, obviously like writing psychology articles. Like I'm talking like, academic papers um, but one, <laughs> that, 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 no one wants to read that stuff trust me but when i started writing on medium.com which was back in 2015 and that's really where i started just dumping my genuine thoughts and you know just writing purely from the soul um it was not it was not refined writing uh and it, it was my most successful writing and and so i think that for me i'm less worried about the 
like the qual. I guess I'm less worried about the rules of what makes good writing, and I'm more just interested in the energy, the emotion, and uh, the genuineness of it. And so I don't really, I don't really have any of those rules. Like, is this the is this the right type of story I should use? Should I not be referencing myself so much? I mean, even in the gap and the gain, I I probably reference myself more than I should. Um, but I, you know, in the case of my books with Dan Sullivan, I've kind of made myself his case study for presenting his ideas. And so, um, yeah, I don't really have an answer, but the thing that I have found by writing on medium specifically is that there was no rules. <laughs> like the, the, the actual writing, like I would write like maybe like a 500 word article. None of them have quality paragraphs. I'm not it, like, it's just in terms of like an English major coming and critiquing it, it's garbage, it's trash, but it was very deep. Like if I, if I went back and read it, it would hit me emotionally. And so that's kind of more what I think I'm going for um, than if I'm following any rules. So that, that I, I like that. I like that idea because I mean, you were for many years, the number one author on medium.com. So, I mean, you, you went on to be able, you wanted to be a professional writer. You've gone on to get, you know, have your books published. As I mentioned, you have four. You've recently spoken about the fact that you were able to uh, lock down another four book deal um, that's kind of favorable to what you want to write and how you want to write. So from the outside, your life looks like this to me. It's like grew up in kind of a, a, a good home that turned to a bad home. <laughs> you were a late bloomer who had to kind of find yourself. You went to uh, university and school and got a tremendous amount of training. And then like that you wanted to be a writer. Now you're a writer. I mean, that's, that's, that's the highlight reel. That's how it looks. I know that that's not the truth, but um, it seems like for someone who was came at it uh, late, like figuring out what it is you wanted to do in your twenties and all of this stuff. I mean, damn, you've, you've, you've been very successful very quickly. Have you not? Yeah. I mean, it's all relative. I'm definitely uh, just measuring my own progress, but what happened was, uh, so I, I was on that church mission from 2008 to 2010. And so during those two years, I was very much deep in study. I was reading tons of books. I journaled. I mean, I, I got my journal right here. I probably write in my journal, who knows, 25 minutes a day. Uh, and to me, it's just cathartic. To me, it's just getting my thoughts out. I, I love visualizing my future self. I love just writing and thinking. And while I'm just in my journal, that's when my best ideas come. And so I was doing that actively for two years as a missionary. And then I continued to do that throughout my undergrad. So I wanted to write as soon as I got home from that experience in 2010. And I even attempted to write. I, I, I wrote probably two or three very crappy books in Word documents that just found their way into a recycle bin on the computer. Um, but from 2010 to 2000 ish end of 2014. So for over four years, I got my bachelor in psychology. I probably read a couple hundred books on psychology, self-development business, and I journaled a lot. And so once I actually started writing on medium, I don't know how much time I had spent writing in my journal. Um, you know, if you're going to talk about the 10,000 hour rule, like multiples of that. And so once I just started writing, it did, the results did come pretty quick. Um, but I had, I had had so much energy. I mean, I had spent at least the last seven years wanting to do it. And so once I started doing it, I did get a lot of luck, but I also threw out a lot. I mean, it's not like my first article went viral. I probably wrote a hundred articles that, you know, and then eventually one of them kicked. And then I started to just deliberately practice and learn my way into what worked. But like, you know, you and your wife, and I'm jumping around a lot. Yeah, you're fine. You and your wife, <laughs> you and your wife. Um, I mean, when you were doing, getting your undergrad, you mentioned that you were earning like 13 grand a year as a TA and, um, and like you decide that you want to become a writer. Did you not worry about supporting you and your massively growing family? <laughs> So this I mean, you have six kids now, but a bunch through adoption, uh, a bunch, uh, I guess a few naturally, but, um, yeah. How did you not freak out about how you're going to keep a roof over your head while you're pursuing this passion of writing? Yeah. So the specifics are, I was in my first year of my PhD program when I started blogging online. <clears throat> so this was early 2015. Um, so I'm in my first year of my PhD program. I'm working as a research assistant, making $13,000 a year. And basically I just started blogging online. 
I didn't have like a game plan on when I would quit. I just figured I've got four more years. A PhD is a five-year program. And so I just figured I've got five years to figure out this writing career. I can do it in the morning and then go to class. And then I go home and spend time with my wife and my three foster kids. And so I wasn't really worried about the finances in the beginning. I, I will say I definitely felt like I needed to figure it out. I needed to learn how to build the platform and turn it into income, but I felt like I had time. Like I, it's not like I dedicated full time to writing in the beginning. It was just wake up at five in the morning, write blog posts before class. And, you know, then I took some online courses and I just studied bit by bit, like a year later when it was 2016, I read Russell Brunson's com secrets, learned about landing pages, learned how to actually like get more email subscribers. And, and it, mostly my focus was on just one thing at a time. In the beginning, it was just learning how to write and sharing my ideas on medium. Then, then the focus became growing my email list. And then eventually once my email list started growing, then it was like, okay, how do I get the book deal? Um, so, um, I mean, I, I had primarily one goal, which was get to a hundred thousand email subscribers because at that level, I knew I could get a six figure book deal. That was something I learned from Jeff Goins. Um, you know, he had told me just try to get yourself to a hundred thousand email subscribers. And so I was just learning and optimizing towards that one goal. And then once I hit that goal, I was able to get a $220,000 book deal for what became willpower doesn't work. And that, that was my first real income as a, as an author, as an entrepreneur, uh, and then over, over the subsequent, you know, four years, I've learned increasingly how to monetize my email list, get book deals and stuff. So it wasn't really a big race towards figuring out how to, how to pay for my family. We were just living meagerly because I was a PhD student and that was the expectation anyways. <laughs> it's Honestly, like, I'm an academic. So you know what you were getting into when you married me, wife. Yeah. Right? I mean, I was a graduate student and no one expects anyone to make very much money as a graduate student. And so I felt like I had time, the pressure was off, but I actually felt internal pressure just because, you know, we did have three foster kids and I just wanted to, you know, I studied how to succeed. I studied how to get email subscribers. I studied how to launch products, uh, how to get book deals. I invested as well. You know, I hired Ryan holiday, um, back in 2017, actually it's 2016. Um, I hired him, I literally paid him a few thousand dollars just to have a few conversations with me and help me write the book proposal. And then he hooked me up with an agent and, uh, you know, so, I mean, I invested, I mean, it was scary taking $2,000 or more you know, $2,000 and giving it to Ryan holiday for two conversations. But I kind of, I believe in that stuff. I believe in, you know, exercising fear and just like, you know, doing something towards your future self. And so for me, that stuff thrills me. And so even though I didn't have a lot of money. I was excited giving that money to Ryan holiday in that situation because I felt like I was proving to myself that I wanted to do it. And so that just increased my commitment to keep going and to figuring it out. Hmm. That is so interesting. Uh, so I, I couldn't help but note. And, and I mean, you mentioned in, in a few of your books, you mentioned Joe Polish, but I couldn't help but notice that in the gap in the game, he is the number one person listed in the dedications, even above even above your kids, your wife. Now, that's interesting to me because for anyone who doesn't know, Joe Polish runs Genius Network. He is kind of the man behind the scenes for decades in terms of marketing. Really, really smart guy, really well connected. Um, so I, I, I pieced from knowing him, I've pieced together from the stories in your book that being a part of that network or being connected with him certainly open doors because a lot of the people you reference come from that group of people. Yeah. And so what happened? What, what, what did Joe, you know, bring to you or unlock for you that has had such a transformation kind of within your own career? Yeah, absolutely. So I first heard of genius network in 2014 during the first year of my PhD program. So I started in August of 2014. And so by the time I started writing, it was like January of 2015. My aunt Jane actually joined genius network. Um, mm. she owns a small, you know, it's growing business, but it's a great business. Um, and, uh, she joined genius network, no clue how she came across it, but she invested the $25,000 in it, you know, and that was a massive psychological leap, you know, initially to invest in a group, essentially a marketing group, but she actually was, would just call me, you know, we've always, we've been really close me and her, and we would share our own personal development and stuff like that for years. And so this was in 2014 and she was just blown away by what she was learning. She would send me little books, little quote books from Dan Sullivan. I had no clue who Dan Sullivan was. Um, 
and for some reason I was just blown away and inspired. And I didn't really know a lot about genius network or even about masterminds or about groups like that. But one thing I noticed when I actually did a little research on it was a lot of my favorite authors were at least associated Tim Ferriss, you know, um, et cetera, Peter Diamandis, a lot of the people whose books I was reading around that time, I noticed that they were interviewed by Joe Polish and they seemed to be a part of that network. And so I just made it my goal to get into that, um, uh, into genius network before I graduated with my PhD. When I, when I got that book deal and usually how book deals work is they pay you in thirds or fourths. As soon as I got my first book deal and I think we got like a $70,000 check, um, first row money, I took that money and immediately signed up for genius network. So I took 25,000 of that and just immediately joined. My wife was like, I don't even know what this is. I don't know what you're doing. And I'm like, I'm like, I feel like if I get in that environment, I'll learn what I need to know. And I'll, I'll, I'll be around and I'll get the connections I need to get to figure this out. Cause I don't want to try to figure all this out on my own. And so, yeah, basically I joined in 2017, went to my first meeting. Uh, I shared my blogging strategies. One of the things that they allow you to do in genius network is that, you know, you give 10 minute talks. And so I signed up and luckily for me, I had my aunt in there who kind of gave me all the tips. And so she's like, you got to give a 10 minute talk during your first meeting. So I just taught about how I was getting 20,000 emails a month on medium and you know, immediately everyone was like, holy cow, who's this guy getting 20,000 emails a month on his blog? And, you know, how are you making money? And at the time I really wasn't making any money. I I'd just got my book deal. And that was like the first real money I had. Um, but I just, over time, over the years, did you uh, feel like an imposter when you were there or did you feel like you fit in? I, I definitely, my first meeting felt like, like I was in the big leagues. I felt like it was, I felt like I was, I was stepping around people who knew way more than I, who had way more experience than me. Um, and then basically over the next several years, I, I invested into Joe's higher, higher up group and just really immersed myself. Uh, I just tried my best to, you know, one of the things that Joe Polish talks about is life gives to the giver. And so he's really big on just being of service and just trying to help other people. And so I, I just tried my best to be uh, as valuable uh, of a person in that group as I could. Um, and it wasn't long, you know, it was literally in 2018, it was a year later, I was in the group with Dan Sullivan and he presented who not how to the group. It was like a new brainchild of his. He had just come up with the idea. It was still kind of sketchy in his head and he gave a training on it. And I just told, you know, at that point, willpower doesn't work. It already been published. And Dan knew me of, you know, me as the top blogger on medium. But when he presented who not how to the group, just in a 15 minute training, and I talk about this in Who Not How, but I, I rode my little chair over to him and I just said, Dan, if you ever want to turn this into a major book, I would love to co-author that with you. And he, he just immediately said, yes, it took two years from that <laughs> conversation for the book to finally come out just because of logistical reasons. But yeah, I mean, I just tried to be of service. I would say that there's probably three or four people I met through Genius Network that changed everything for me. One being Dan, you know, aside from Joe himself, Joe, I continued, but Dan, Tucker Max, and then a guy named Dre Redfern. Dre Redfern is the one who taught me how to actually like turn my business into a business. You know, he helped me go to six figures and then helped me go to seven figures in my mm -hmm. online business, all just from like learning from him, collaborating with him. Tucker obviously helped me with the book side and then just collaborating with Dan is just a cool thing that is a dream. So, yeah, yeah. that's, that's cool. You know, it's, it's curious cause I'm trying to figure out, I, I find that people often self-identify as, you know, I'm an academic in which case they're not going to be necessarily great business people. Um, I'm a professional. Think about lawyers, dentists, doctors, terrible business people. Creatives don't understand anything. They just give everything away. And then there's business people who, who are like, they're, they're all different groups, different values and whatnot. So what I see is like a man who got a PhD, must be a little bit academic. Um, you know, you read a lot, you invest a lot, you surround yourself with great people. You're willing to take these leaps but also within your writing, I mean, that's a creative endeavor. And so, but you also are a professional, like you cross so many boundaries. I don't know if you notice that about yourself, but, but uh, how is that? And would you consider yourself more of one out of kind of these different groups, whether that's business or academic or creative or what have you? Yeah, I would say primarily my, my identity or my core motivation is generally learning. Like I, I just love mm -hmm. learning. Like that's, 
that's the thing I like more than even writing. Like I just love reading, learning, journaling, thinking. I like having my mind expanded. And so that kind of probably fits within, you know, the academic you, side. You have also a great just... memory as well. So that helps. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I mean, you, you must, because the way that you rhyme off some of these things, I'm like, I don't know how, I don't know how this guy remembers everything. Oh, thank you. I feel like memory is a skill. I feel like it's, um, it's something you can develop. And, uh, so yeah, I think primarily I'm a learner. Um, I generally, my, my main thing I like to learn is it's just about human development. And so that kind of drives um, my interests in what I write about. I do like teaching in the form of whether it be having a conversation with you or coaching or whatnot. Like I like learning and I like teaching and I do like writing. Um, I do enjoy writing. I, I liked it more when I was a blogger. Um, mm -hmm. Writing blog posts where I could just sit and riff and there you know, was a different experience than writing books. Writing books... I'm, I'm coming around to it. It's a new skill. I'm still pretty novice at it, but it, it, the reason I like writing books now is because now it's teaching me how to really learn a topic. And so I just write the things I want to learn. I wanted to learn about who, not how. So I wrote who, not how, like I didn't see myself as the expert. I saw like, that's the thing I want to get good at. Um, with the gap in the game, I really just wanted to understand happiness and I wanted to understand identity. I wanted to understand a lot of things. And so that was the book I wanted to write. Um, what did you want to learn when you wrote Personalities and Permanent? Um, that book, I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to better understand how, you know, how, how to let go of the past uh, and how to, just how change works. Um, right now, I'm actually writing a book called Be Your Future Self Now, which mm. is, I think, the upgraded version of Personalities and Permanent. Um, yeah, I mean... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't read that one read this one instead that is so it, it's so funny to me but yeah i mean just back to your question um i'm 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 becoming someone who i think is more professional uh, i think i was very sloppy when it came to running a business being an entrepreneur being a leader that stuff was not uh natural strength for me but just because i love learning and because it's relevant to my future self it's it's where i'm getting a lot of deliberate practice it's where i'm learning, you know, who, not how is one example, you know, like me writing that book, me directly learning from Dan Sullivan, me working with people like Tucker or even, you know, Dre or anyone, that's all just me, um, learning something that's not, not what you would call like first nature. Like that's just, that's just me learning. And so I'm learning how to become more professional. Um, but that's, that's still taking time. And, you know, I'm further than I was two years ago, but yeah. still quite novice when it really comes down to it. And so you, you've mentioned future self a whole bunch of times and the, you know, personality is impermanent. What I, what I find, what I really loved about that. I was telling you a bit before we started recording, like I love the idea that you can make proactive changes to help point yourself in the right direction. And I've seen this in my life. You know, when I was younger, uh, my wife and I bought our first starter home in 2008. So I'm a little older than you in 2008, we bought a starter home. Yay. Six months before a recession. Um, and, uh, I started my business in 2006. So, you know, there was a time in, in 2009 where we had like zero money, zero revenue, zero clients for a bunch of months. And I'm struggling through that stuff. But as we started to rebuild kind of the business and income and everything, I, you know, it was this really small home, really small mortgage. I was like, I want to pay this mortgage off as fast as possible. Within six years, we paid it off. And it was like, just because it's in the back of my mind, because it's there. I set this goal. It was happened. My wife decided immediately we need a new house. <laughs> so once but, you put it off, you and got a new house. My, my wife decided, yes, after we renovated everything, paid everything off, made it exactly the way we wanted. She said, we have to leave because we had four kids and it was a very small starter home. So, so did, you, did you keep it or sell it? We sold it. We sold it. We used that money to buy the home we're in now. Uh, but, but there's a bunch of things, you know, like I, I want to take, um, I'm, I'm planning my, my oldest son is 13 when he's 17 or 18, we want to ride across America on, on dirt bikes. And we've always had this idea. And so I, I didn't realize that like, I got laser eye surgery a few years ago. I did that because subconsciously I was thinking, well, if I'm going to be riding in a helmet all the time, I need, I can't wear glasses. Um, and I lost a bunch of weight because I was thinking, well, if I'm going to be on a motorcycle all the time, my back hurts, my leg hurts, I need to get stronger. And so I started strength training. So I started doing all these things, not realizing that I'm moving in the direction of this goal. So I realize, like rationally, I know that if you set a goal and if you decide how you need to show up and who needs to show up and all of that stuff, that you can shape that outcome in that future. And then the other side of me goes, this is 
crazy. This is like, is it, this is bananas. Is this going to work? What am I doing? What, what is going on? Who does this? And I can't help but feel completely like risky for being willing to step out in faith and do these big things to become the person I need to be because I'm still so rooted in like, well, my past. And so with your book, with personalities and permanent, a lot of your writing, you talk about the importance of the future and how your past does not define you, but your future does. And the present doesn't even really matter that much. And this is like, so such a different way of thinking for me that, that part of me goes like, yes, confirmation bias, something to prove that it will work. But deep down inside, I'm like, what if it doesn't? Yeah, well, what I'm wondering is, is I mean, you've already watched yourself do it before, right? You watched <laughs> yourself buy a house and then pay it off. And now you're like living in a bigger house. Now you have four kids. And so I think, you know, if you just looked at your current self and measured it against your former self, right? Where you were back in 2008, right? Like you've probably already achieved most of the dreams of your former self. You're probably, you might be even beyond where you thought you would be. You might be beyond, uh, wait, yeah, is that, I mean, is any, like the line you, that you what, have, which that? is, which is like, okay, if you looked and you talk about this, right? Most people think that they've arrived. If you look 10 years into the future, you'll think you won't make much progress. Yeah. But if you look over the last 10 years of your past, you go, holy smokes, I've come so far. Um, I, 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 I understand it all. Yeah. It doesn't help with the anxiety. It doesn't help with the worry. It doesn't help with the, well, what ifs and all of those other things. Yeah. I think that that's, um, I think that's pretty normal to have anxiety towards the future because it's beyond your current comprehension. It's, it's, it's outside your knowledge or outside of your experience. And so therefore you don't have a lot of reference points for it, except for that you can kind of see it, identify it and you want it, but you don't know the hows, you don't have the clear pathway of getting there. And so, you know, you're questioning if it's possible, you know, you're, you're questioning how much you should invest in it because at this point you've got more to lose, right? You've got your, house, you got your wife, you got your four kids. And so there's more loss avoidance that's, you know, probably springing up kind of what you said in the beginning of our conversation though, is, um, whether it be on, on the other side of pain or on the other side of fear, you realize that your fears were inflated and that usually if you just take an action, 80% or more of your downsides that you thought were going to happen, aren't there. And, you know, then you realize you can figure out how to do it. You, 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 first time you bought a house, you know, you figured out how to do it. And then you've set a goal and you figured out how to make more money to pay it off. And so it, it, I think it's just interesting whenever you actually just try something, if you just put yourself in a position where you, you know, you're moving forward, you usually will figure it out. I mean, that's, that's, so I, I think what, uh, what's helping me these days is not taking my current self so seriously, which is kind of what you already alluded to that the present doesn't matter that much. I mean, I love the present. I'm right here. I'm right here in this conversation, but I'm not that worried about my present self's ignorance or limitations. I really don't care that Benjamin Hardy of, of the current conversation doesn't know what Benjamin Hardy in a year is going to know. And I'm not overly attached to my current opinions. I'm not attached to my current knowledge. I, I love it though. I mean, I love where I'm at right now, but I also love that I'm a non-finished product. And that's really one of my favorite quotes actually from Daniel Gilbert, the Harvard psychologist who spent a lot of time studying future self. As he said, human beings are works in progress that mistakenly think they're finished. I have a lot of freedom in knowing that current Benjamin Hardy is nowhere near finished. And it doesn't matter if I'm unpolished right now. It doesn't matter if I'm not, you know, if I don't have everything figured out. It doesn't matter if my bank account's not what I want it to be. It doesn't matter if my shoes are dirty. When I step into that genius network and I have no clue who those people are, or if I don't, you know. And so I feel a lot of, free, and I think that that's the essence of a growth mindset actually is, is to not attach to your current self, um, but to be more interested in your future self. So I don't know. I find a lot of freedom in just not worrying about it. Um, one of the other things that's helping me a lot is uh, emotional development, which I do talk quite a bit about in Personalize and Permanent, learning to just neutralize what you're experiencing. So if you have anxiety or fear towards something, rather than feeling that little bit of discomfort and then trying to escape, to dive as deeply into it as possible, like to just to just go straight into it and actually feel what you're feeling and then you neutralize it. I mean, that's how you neutralize trauma as well as you just go straight at it. You think about it, you feel it, and then you reframe it. Um, you can do that same thing with pain or with fear. Um, uh, whereas most people, you know, if, it, if let's just call it an experience is a swimming pool, most people, they dip their foot in and then quickly get out as fast as possible because it's, a, but if you just jump in to the emotion of it literally and think about it, it's crazy how fast the emotion dissipates and, and you can practice this on little things. You know, one of my kids is just, screaming and yelling, 
my natural reaction or like my former self would get angry at him. And I'm just trying to practice being completely neutral about it, completely neutral. Oh, he's yelling. He's, you know, screaming. I don't need to be upset about this. How can I just talk to this person? And so just becoming more neutral <laughs> about your feelings. Um, and you can practice, you can practice in small ways, you know, I mean, I'm practicing right now, um, you know, and so you can practice when the stakes are low. That's so that, you know, Trevor Moed's book, um, it takes what it takes talks about, um, you know, this, this neutral point. Um, and so this is, this is all, you know, when I tend to read a bunch of books at the same time, they all swim together in points. I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> I love this so much. And then it's those, yeah, it's those times late at night where I just question the like, what am I doing and will it work out and all of those things. And I think that's natural, but. Are you actually questioning anything right now? Um, I was questioning a lot of things March through April, and now I'm living on the other side of those decisions. So you've already pulled the trigger on a lot of these decisions and just you're now going to deal with it one way or another. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so what led you to, uh, you know, cross the point of no return ultimately? Uh, so I, I've spent, I've spent the last few years not particularly happy and not realizing that I was unhappy. And I've spent a bunch of years, um, you know, I'm 38 now. So around 35, I kind of hit the point where I was like, is this it? You know, is we were, my wife and I since then lost a lot of weight. We got a lot healthier. I've shift, made a ton of shifts in my business. I've, but, but I, I, we started so young. We were so focused on achievement, so young, and we're, we're able to hit things. When you say over 10 years, I mean, I was 28, 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, my, I didn't have my, my, my third child was just a newborn. We were in our old house. We were, um, gosh, 2011. We weren't anywhere near the success level that we wanted or the income we wanted or any of those things. Um, but when I hit, when I hit it, the stuff that we wanted, it was just like, is this it? Is this it? Like, this is, this is now what we do for the rest of our lives. Uh, and everything else seemed so big and so scary. And so for the last few years, I've been unwinding things and learning what's really important and, and cutting away and cutting away and cutting away. But um, finally in the spring, I said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out of what I've been doing. I'm going to focus on what's next for me. And I'm kind of talking in code a bit, but I'm going to focus on what's next for me. And that feels incredibly challenging and scary because I literally, through your book and through a few other books that I referenced, I decided I am going to step out in faith. Now, everybody, when they tell you to do this, when they talk about manifesting or, or, or setting goals or making these changes, they always caveat it with, well, don't be stupid. Like, like, you know, get your finances in order or put a plan together. Don't just be stupid. But I couldn't do that for myself. Like I've wasted too much time because the plan wasn't right because this wasn't right. Like I literally had to just, he just to went like, all in hell or high water come what may we're going to do this. Um, I'm going to work through some of the challenges, the relationship challenges, the business challenges. Um, we'll figure out income in the future, I guess, yeah. like just let's go. And so part of why I ask all these questions as well on your career is I'm just, I feel so akin and so inspired by, by what you do and what you've done that like, again, part of my whole mission is like, we can, we can step out and make these changes in one they're not as risky as you think they are. Definitely. Two, um, people, when you, when you are very intentional and truthful, people are very, very graceful. They extend a tremendous amount of grace. And when you're clear and excited about what you want to do, people want to help you make it happen. And, and it's just like, okay, okay. Now I know, I know in 10 years, I'll look back and go like, boy, was that an exciting time? Like, boy, was that a good decision? But for the next year or two, who knows? <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen, honestly? Yeah, I think that's a great place to be. I think that uh, the more you can dive into it, you know, back to the swimming pool idea and spend more time there, uh, the faster, you know, it'll be neutralized, the quicker you'll learn whatever you need to learn. And so, yeah, I think that's a, it's a great spot to be. And I think that it's good to have those experiences regularly. It's good to to not just reach some point where it's like, okay, this is who I'm going to be for the rest of my life. But to, to make some shifts or to, to change a direction or to start fresh. And 
that comes with a lot of good stuff. I do think, um, I think over time, whether it be financially, you build security or whether it just be confidence wise, you have security that, you know, you'll figure it out. Um, it doesn't take away the fear because sometimes you, we make a shift, which is uh, a lot more authentic to who we really want to be. Uh, whether that be you completely shift directions or maybe for me, maybe I just completely start writing about different things, <laughs> you know, um, you know, so there are times when you make uh, a shift that's scary, but I think where you're at right now and your confidence and your ability to navigate this uncertainty, your ability to navigate the complexity or the challenge, it's kind of like your threshold for, or your, your tolerance for fear or pain is so dramatically different from where it was 10 years ago that, you know, you're handling it very well. You know, I know what it feels like. And I know, and I know, but I was, I was actually thinking about this today. Like I, I have developed a pretty strong tolerance for pain and for fear where I, I, I almost am to the point and I wouldn't call it an adrenaline junkie, but I like taking those risks and putting myself in a, I call it a forcing function, right? You put yourself in a position where it forces you forward but I, yeah, you talk about this with the the uh, triathlon or, or something, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I like putting myself in a position where I don't have the answers, um, and and then figuring it out. I, I figured it out. The former versions of myself figured it out with way less knowledge, way less money, way less network, way less capability, and and so, um, you know, I know that my current self can figure it out as well. And so I think it, yeah. that's, that the, the concept that I really like in psychology is called psychological flexibility. Um, and really what that means is that you're, you can handle uncertainty. You can handle your emotions while you're dealing with stress and while you're moving towards goals without knowing how to get there, you can be more flexible rather than letting your emotions push you back to your comfort zone. You become increasingly flexible outside your comfort zone. And so I, I like, I like putting myself in those situations where I'm not comfortable um, and where it's, t where it's ambiguous, how do I solve this problem? Uh, and then ultimately I find that we, we, we can figure things out pretty quick. And so it's, yeah. it's nice to just stick yourself out in that situation often. Hmm. And, and that's, it's what I'm struggling with the most right now. And I've identified it, which is awesome is, um, I realize that my natural state and, and I'll say natural state because I can move myself away from there with enough energy, with enough excitement, with enough willpower. But, but when those things run out, I smack back into my natural state, it seems, which is pessimistic, fixed mindset, scarcity mindset. Uh, I live my life entirely in the future. So the idea of future casting or, or future, like I live my life so in the future, yeah. but, um, but that gives me anxiety. And so, so, I was even talking to my wife the other day. It's like, I need to find like, I need to find a therapist or a program. I need to find something like something that can help move people from fixed to growth more than just knowing about it. I know about it, but that doesn't help to move from scarcity to abundance. I know about it, but it doesn't seem to help um, to realize, don't worry, future you's got this. You don't have to worry. Future you's got this. Future you will figure it out. You survived everything that you've done in the past. You will survive everything that comes to you in the future. Like, like, how do you help those of us who just are so addicted to certainty, are so sure that things will go wrong, are, are so fixed in our mindset as opposed to growth? So that way, everything that we do wrong just feels like, yeah, weren't good enough, didn't show up, didn't do a good enough job. Like, like we're just, so, I, I think more of us are rooted in this than there are people on the other side. And so this is yeah. what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah. I mean, you're dead right. Uh, the essence of the fixed mindset is the fear of failure. You know, it's because if you fail, that means you weren't good enough, right? Rather than the growth mindset, meaning if you fail, if you failed, you could learn from it and get better, right? If the fixed, if, if the fixed mindset fails, they can't get better because they're fixed. Right. And so if they failed, that means that's their cap. Um, I guess a question I have for you just before I, you know, <laughs> dive into some thoughts, <laughs> how long are those cycles? when you catch yourself, you know, you're go, 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 you're excited. And then something triggers, something doesn't go right. Or something happens and you, 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 you go back to, um, 
let's just call it a cycle where you go yeah. through that cycle. Yeah. Two, I, I three, will say five that months. How long are those cycles where you, you know, and how so often do they happen? It's so fast that in the fall, I thought that I had borderline personality disorder and I started looking into it and I actually went into therapy because I, I was like, I was so sure, like the cycles were so quick. I was certain that it was that. Now it turns out I just have GAD, which is generalized anxiety disorder. Um, and with diet, with exercise, with sleep, with um, removing stuff that I don't like, like being focused on the things that motivate me and excite me the most, it helps. But um, it, could, it could be a few times, you know, it could be a few times in a day. It could be just a few times in a week. Um, and, uh, yeah, like, like I know coming out of this conversation we have and, and my team does not like me coming out of these conversations, I will feel like I didn't make the best use of this hour with you. Like, like the story didn't go the way we could have, that the questions didn't go like the conversation. We didn't make it like, I know that I'll be like just a list of things where it's like, I had this one hour with, with this person that I so love and respect. <laughs> and why did I waste it talking about that? Like, like, you know, it's, it's just yeah. so ingrained. Yeah. So just because it's fresh on my mind, uh, I'll briefly explain what the gap and the gain is. <clears throat> Cause it sounds like you spent a lot of time in the gap. And I was like, I do. need this. <laughs> well, like, so the gap is when you measure yourself against an ideal, right? So you leave this conversation and now you're measuring it against the ideal. Why didn't I talk about this? Why didn't I talk about that? Like you're, you've now immediately devalued this conversation and you've devalued, um, all of your progress, you've devalued the fact that we had this conversation in any form of learning because now you're measuring against what it should have or could have been. Oh, that makes me feel bad. I hope you don't. I... <laughs> no, no, not at all. No, I'm literally just explaining the gap and the gain. And so I, I, I believe that humans do this all the time. I mean, we're always measuring ourselves against ideals, you know, like I, I hit this goal, you know, you just, you just bought this new house. Right. And now like, Oh, you're not yet where you want to be. So who cares that you've just made massive progress over the last 10 years, because you know, now the, the measuring stick keeps moving. Um, and even in any given situation, you can measure yourself against an ideal. Like, for example, my wife, you know, and I talk about this in the book, but like my wife makes our kids dinner and they get to the table and they complain because it's not their favorite food. They're measuring what's in front of them against an ideal. And that comes from comparison. It comes from, you know, just it comes from a lot of different things, but anytime you measure yourself against an ideal, you've immediately devalued your current self and your current growth. And so I think that one thing that's helping me to be happier and also to stay in a more positive mindset without the constant back and forths is literally staying in the game, which mm -hmm. is I'm just running my own race. You know, I'm not competing against you. I'm not competing against anyone. And even in this conversation, um, I can't control what you say and I can't control what the listener interprets. And so the only thing that I can control is my own experience in this conversation. And that's the only that, and, and so the only judgment I have is that we had a great conversation. I got to go on a really great podcast and, you know, and then I can just reference the gains. What are the things that I learned from this? Um, what are the things that I got out of it? What, you know, the fact that this amazing person's read some of my books, that's, that's a crazy gain. And so I can just stockpile those. And um, when you're in the gain versus the gap, the only thing you're comparing yourself against is your former self. Um, it's kind of like in a video game, like, I don't know if you ever played Mario Kart where you could race your own ghost. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, that's it, man. I'm just racing Benjamin Hardy from yesterday. I don't really care about anyone else. Um, and I get to look back and just see that I am two steps ahead of where I was yesterday. Even if, if, even if this conversation is the only thing I did, Benjamin Hardy of yesterday hadn't had this conversation. And so... You're welcome. <laughs> seriously, seriously. <laughs> and so I think, I think being in the game... Uh, it kills the gap. And when you're out of the gap, then you can appreciate your progress. And when you appreciate your progress, not only are you more grateful, but you're also more confident because confidence comes by referencing your former progress. And that confidence then can help you to make more self-determined action forward. Um, I also think it does neutralize. One other just quick thing I'll share um, is removing needs. You know, and I do talk about this in the book, but I don't need to be a New York times bestseller to be successful. I want it. You know, I don't need to have $10 million. Like I don't need anything beyond what I currently have. You know, when you remove need from the equation, you can have, you can want things, you can get hundred percent committed towards things, but if you feel like you need it, then obviously there's a gap. And obviously there's something that you feel is inadequate with your current self. And you feel like 
you feel like there's a hole there and that you need that thing to fill that hole, whether it's that person's approval, whether it's that achievement. And if you can realize that right now you actually are enough right now, you are worthy, you know, right now you're an amazing person and look at all of your gains and look at all of your progress. Now, what do you want? You don't need anything beyond what you have, but what do you want? You can go get what you want, but you don't need it. Um, that heals a lot. And so, uh, removing needs in, which is essentially unhealthy attachments, um, really helps you know i'm freaking grateful for my life grateful for this conversation and uh, i'm very proud of where i've come from i and i'm excited about my future but there's nothing i need beyond what i currently have do you feel behind does that does that i mean being very future focused um it, does it does it not make you feel like you've either wasted time or that you're behind or is again, this just falling into the gap, the gap. This is scarcity. This is all, all well, that's that the stuff, gap. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, you're behind to who, who are you comparing yourself with? You know, like that's the gap. Like who you're, are you behind? Well, I guess you're, yeah. You, you know, know, if I, you're I always... behind, then you're behind someone. I mean, if you're behind your future self, then, you know, <laughs> they'll pull you forward. But you know, if you're, if you feel behind it, I would ask you, what's your reference point? What, what are you behind from? Where well, typically it's expectations, what? right? It's whose it's, expectations? It's your own, your own hopes and dreams, and um, you know, so much, so much of our disappointment, I think, comes from uh, how things should go, right? The expectations, like my wife believes that I should have acted a certain way, or that you know, in your your with your kids, you know, your wife cooks this beautiful meal, she places it on the table, and they're complaining. The, dis the up getting upset about how your kids should respond to this meal and where I should have been by now. And all of these things are, again, just expectations. And when things don't go the way that we were hoping they would go or, or felt that they should have gone, uh, especially if you feel like you deserve it or if you worked hard or any of those things, it's just um, it just leaves people really disappointed. And uh, I would say almost trapped, right? Like there's almost a sense of, of being of being trapped and, and, and that's like a terrible place to live. Yeah. I mean, if you don't need that thing anymore, whatever it is you feel you're behind, if you don't need it anymore, you're no longer behind. Like seriously. Um, I, uh, I think when you're in the game, you're no is there longer no behind. Risk? Is there no risk of complaint? Like I know high achievers, like, is there no risk if you're not always living that way or pushing that way that you'll get complacent then? Not at all. I actually think that for the first time in your life, you might be purely intrinsically motivated, um, where you're literally doing it because it's for yourself and because you love it and because you want it. It's no longer to be somewhere, to be someone, to achieve something. Like it's literally, you're doing it for yourself. Um, you no longer need to be there and you can actually appreciate being here. And, uh, yeah. Then, then you're in control of what you do. Then it's, then you're no longer being tugged or pulled by, by whatever you think is pressuring you to get somewhere. And you actually can just sit back and say, what do I want to do now? Um, in philosophy, they break down freedom into two categories, freedom from versus freedom to freedom. Fr and, and this also resonates with, uh, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy. So like he's got his hierarchy of needs, you know, but like the bottom ones are all freedom from you free yourself from hunger. You know, you free yourself from low self-esteem, you know, you free yourself from the elements, you know, like, and the purpose of self-actualization is, is that you've literally freed yourself from internal and external constraints so that now you're in a position of freedom where you can now be free to do whatever you want to do. And so once you free yourself from all of those expectations, those needs, you know, trying to please other people, trying to control their perception of you. Once you can just realize that like the only thing you can actually control is your own perception, how you define things, how you measure your own self, how you measure your own progress. Once you've freed yourself from all of that, then you're finally in the position of the higher order freedom, which is what are you going to do now? Now you are free to be whoever you want to be. And there's no one telling you what to do. There's no one who tells you, you have to do this. There's no, societal expectations, not even your wife's expectations. Um, yes, you can be in a, a really beautiful relationship with her where you collaborate and stuff, but at the end of the day, you can't make her happy. Like her happiness is her responsibility. <laughs> like you can't control her perception. You can serve her, you can love her, you can, but at the end of the day, she's the only one who is having her own experiences. She's the only one who defines what her own experiences mean. And so, um, 
yeah, it certainly doesn't kill complacency. Actually, what I believe it does is it, uh, or sorry, it doesn't create complacency. What I actually think it does is it, for the first time, enables people to become self-determined, where they have autonomy of choosing what they want. And also you start to build genuine confidence because you, you know, me measuring my own gains, let's just call it from last week. I could be in the gap and say, I didn't accomplish all my goals. I wanted to film 20 YouTube videos. I only filmed eight, or I can say I filmed eight YouTube videos. Here's all the other things I did. You know, I took my son to, you know, we went out to dinner last night. <laughs> we went, we had pizza. I can actually, I can actually genuinely appreciate my experience and I can define what my experience means and I can value my experience rather than devalue it. And, and then I can say, well, okay, now what do I want to do for my future? Um, and so it actually, for me, builds confidence and it also increases my, my, uh, my motivation towards what matters to me. And, and so it certainly doesn't create complacency. To me, it creates confidence. It's crazy to me to like, I cannot picture you being the teenager who played video games and hung out and did all the skateboard and did all that stuff and barely got through high school. Like I, you know, I love impact theory, Tom Bill, you, I know you were on, you were on his show. Um, I can't picture him struggling to get out of bed and sleeping in and doing all this. Like, I just, I just can't picture the person that I meet, the person the that I'm People who are listening to you can't picture you from 10 years ago either. <laughs> I Seriously. know. I know they can't picture me. The people I'm meeting now, have, they well, can't picture me from three months ago. Well, maybe you couldn't even picture yourself, you know, look at all the weight you've lost. Look at, look at your business. Look at the l risks you're taking. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe four year old, four years ago, a version of you wouldn't have believed in you right now. <laughs> three months ago, version of me doesn't, didn't believe. I just finished this crazy health challenge. It was 120 days of ridiculous, uh, uh, gains. And I, and I, even when I set out on it, I didn't secretly think that it would happen. Um, and so part of me was like, well, it's a good story if I fail, cause I learned some lessons. Um, and it's, it's a great story if I succeed, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's just for those people who are, who feel stuck, you know, mm -hmm. those people, whether you're in your, you're younger. Um, and a lot of our, our, a lot of our listeners and viewers are younger, but, but, you know, I look at people who hit the age of 50 or 55 or 60 and feel like I don't have energy to start again. And I, you know, I just, I can't, it's too much at risk and all these things. It's like, it's crazy to me how long life is and how much you can turn things around. Yeah. And at the same time, how short life is and how precious it is. And you have to be very careful with, with that. Um, but I just, you know, if, if you went back in time, we wouldn't have been able to, I, I don't know. I don't know. Do you think, do you think that version of you was always there? Or do you think literally you crafted it over the years? Uh, that's, that is the magic question. You know what I mean? That's like the ultimate question. I, I think probably the answer is both. Um, I, I believe that the potential of transformation is within all of us. Um, but I do believe that it would have, it's very possible. I could have become a million different versions of who I am today for better and for worse. It's not like I was destined to, to be the person I am today, but that I've made choices to be who I am today. Um, and that my future is also, you know, there's infinite potentials. Um, and I, whether I do, but, uh, one thing I do know is that human beings are very transformable, you know, like, you know, so as an example, my former self, the kid who played 18 hours of world of Warcraft today, um, even my former self a year ago who, you know, didn't know as much about money or about relationships or even about my own kids as I do now. I mean, I've transformed a lot in the last year. And I believe I, I mean, I, through pain, through trial of error, through also just study, through learning from others, um, current me makes radically different decisions, even financially and also with my kids and what I value than me a year ago. And uh, I'm excited to say that my future self will be radically transformed to my current self. And so I, I think that, um, I think it's, important for people to realize just how transformable human beings actually are. Um, being in the gain, I think really helps because it allows you to uh, appreciate the transformation that's already occurred in your own life, which chances are you devalue, not just specifically you, but most people devalue because they're in the gap measuring themselves against ideals rather than appreciating how much they actually have changed uh, and grown. But it's, I, I think that it's an important experience for people to watch themselves transform in various ways. Um, all the science on deliberate practice shows you that you can do that. Um, the book peak is a great book on just showing that like, if you, you know, if you want to become really good at tennis, yeah, you might not think you're good at it now, but if you actually start learning training, maybe you start investing it, you get mentorships, like you can become really good at tennis. If you want to learn a new language, you could learn that Spanish or that German or whatever it is. Like you can go from someone who doesn't know how to speak 
a language to someone who does. You can go from someone who is, you know, out of shape to someone who's fit. You can go from someone who's not good at money to someone who's good at money. You can go from someone who, you know, has low emotional intelligence to someone who's pretty emotionally developed where they aren't as triggered and reactive, but they're more neutral or positive towards things. And so, um, you know, I think it's just a testament really to human beings ability to grow and transform and to learn. And then your current self actually fundamentally being a different person than your former self in, in, in your knowledge and your skills and your capability. It's, it's an apples and orange comparison. You know, the current you knows a lot of things that the former you just simply didn't know. And so if in, if, you know, if you put your former self in your current context without your knowledge, they wouldn't, they'd figure it out, but they wouldn't be able to handle it the way you're handling it. Yeah. And so it's sad to me that most people won't know this, won't come across it. If they did, they won't do anything with the information. Um, I mean, I'll be honest, like I sat down a few days to like future journal, like, Hey, like I took your exercise or I'm like, okay, 90 days in the future, I'm going to write in the present tense. And I like, I get out my journal and I'm like, bah, 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 bah. and then a few days later, it's like, Oh yeah, I should, I should keep doing that stuff. And so, and I feel like pretty intentional about this stuff, but the average person won't do this. And that makes, drives me so crazy. What do you say to people where you know the benefits of this, you know the outcome of it, the science shows that it could work and yet they still won't. Um, I, I think I've, uh, I think former me used to, I don't want to sound like I don't care anymore. Um, former me used to feel like I had more control over other people where I could get them to figure it out. Um, whereas current me now believes that people, if, if someone doesn't want to, there's no reason to, tr I'm not going to say there's no reason to try, but there's no forcing them to want it. Um, you can't get someone to want something you can, you can, it's kind of like you, you know, you can, you can share your own story, your testimony, I guess you could say of your own growth. Um, you can love them. You can serve them. You can give compassion towards them. You can do everything you can to eventually help them get to a place where they start to want to do something, but you can't want something for someone beyond what they want for themselves. Um, and so I guess my, my thought on that is, is I have, a huge belief, um, you know, even on a spiritual side that every human being is a child of God, you know, like that's a belief of mine. Uh, I believe that everyone can grow, change, develop. And so like, I believe that every, everything is there for people. Uh, and I believe that everyone has infinite worth, you know? And so I, I want to give everything I can to be there for any single person I can to give a conversation or to be a, you know, to be an empathetic witness. Right. Um, I also don't feel like I need to force people to places that they're not either wanting to go, you know, if they just don't want to go. Cause I don't, I don't get forced to places I don't want to go either. Um, and so I'm less anxious about it. Um, not that I don't want to, not that I'm not motivated, not that I don't feel like I have a, a sense of purpose or, or mission to, to help and support people, but, um, I'm more in the gain about it than the gap about it. Now I'm not measuring myself against ideals where I'm, I'm beating myself up because I'm not saving the world. Instead, I'm measuring my own gains and I'm looking at, at the people I am helping. I'm looking at the books I have written. I'm looking at my own kids and measuring their own progress. And so I'm not measuring myself against unreachable ideals as much anymore, which only makes me feel garbage for not being a better person rather than just looking at the gains and looking at what I've done in the last year. I know I've helped, I've helped some people and I can just own that, you know, and I've helped myself. I've moved forward. I'm, I'm helping my kids. And so, um, uh, I'm just taking myself more and more out of measuring myself against unreachable ideals, I think. So last question, if I can, uh, for you at the end of the day. So it's, it's so interesting talking to you because you can pluck all these points out of the different books, but also the book, you know, that's coming out and then, and then, you know, you're already working on these other ones. But for you, at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Yeah, I mean, pretty much basic stuff. You know, I believe in God. I believe my family is more important uh, than any of my achievements. Um, you know, and I love learning. I think this is a, an educational experience. And so, yeah, I mean, really, it comes down to that. You know, just me, uh, me learning as much as I can from this experience and me giving as much as I can to this experience and, and over time 
living more in alignment with what I believe in, you know? And so, yeah. Do you find I mean, yourself that, getting pulled away from those things or they get cloudy or, or, or you, you're able to keep them in focus most of the time? I don't, I don't think I'm, I keep them. I don't think I keep them in focus more than anyone else. I still do my own practices. You know, I sit and journal. I, I catch myself working way too much, uh, catch myself yelling at my kids, uh, catch myself, you know, I mean, if you would have talked, if we would have had this conversation three months ago, back when the gap in the gain wasn't done, and I didn't know if it would get done, you know, back to, you know, your own anxieties sometimes about, can I actually do this? If we had been talking three months ago, I'd probably been like, dude, I don't know if I'm going to get this book done. Like, this is too hard. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think none of us are perfect, but I, I definitely am better than my former self. I, I, uh, I'm closer to my older kids, especially the ones we adopted than I, than I was a year ago. Uh, I'm less emotionally reactive than I was a year ago. I'm financially further ahead than I was a year ago. Uh, I'm grateful for the book I wrote, even the gap in the game, you know, I'm, I'm, and so I'm, I'm better than I was a year ago. Um, but I'm radically nowhere near, you know, I'm, I, I'm just as messed up as anyone else, you know, but I'm, I'm better than I was a year ago. And so that's all I'm comparing myself to. As a legit fan of Ben's books and his writing, it was so much fun to just dig into his story and his work. Let me ask you, have you ever watched a film or you read a book and you thought of a question that you wanted answered by the creator? I just got my chance. <laughs> so thank you, Ben. Okay, the three takeaways from this conversation. Number one, you're not finished. As people, we feel like we've arrived, like this is it. We've hit our max. We've done all we can do and become all we can become. But your life is a work in progress. You are a work in progress. You have a lot of time ahead of you, a lot of growth ahead of you. You have not arrived. Number two, you've got to stop measuring your progress against an idealized version of where you think you should be. Every time you measure yourself up against an ideal, you're actually devaluing your real tangible progress and your real growth. So stop it. And number three, remember your future is what actually defines you. Your past, it doesn't define you. Your present also doesn't define you. The only thing that defines who you are is your future. What you are doing today to become the person you will become. So ask yourself, what will you do with that future? Are you gonna set intentional goals? Are you gonna steer yourself towards those goals? That's on you. Now, if you have something to prove to the doubters, the haters, that little voice that screams at you from the back of your mind, if that's you, you've got to face the difficult, the scary, and the hard things in your life. It's not easy. It's never easy. Remember, we, we aren't just dreamers. We're doers because we do hard things. If you need to learn how you can put money to work for you to pay down debt or to get financial freedom, you've got to hear how this expert breaks it all down. Click on the video right over there for that real inspiring conversation.